Okay, Rosani, go ahead. Okay, you need to close your mic because we can hear all the sounds, okay? Thanks. So, good evening, everybody. I am Rosani Silveira, and it's my pleasure to be here to open this uh, event organized by me and by Professor Alison Gonçalves from Universidade Federal do Paraná. Uh, we thought of putting together some sessions in which we would discuss uh, relevant topics in applied linguistics. And for this first session, we would like to address a topic that has become uh, prominent over the past months uh, in the context of the coronavirus pandemic. And this is the topic that we selected for the first session is the role of technology in L2 teaching and learning. We asked our guest speakers to address the following question. Can technology be incorporated in regular uh, school classrooms? So we invited uh, Professor Daniel Gimelo Ferraz and Professor Ronaldo Correa Gomes Jr. to address this question. And I would like to say a few words to the, uh, about our guest speakers. First of all, I would like to thank uh, both of them for accepting our invitation. And Professor, we're gonna start uh, the session with uh, the talk by Professor Ronaldo Correa Gomes Jr. He holds a doctoral degree from uh, the Federal University of Minas Gerais. And he's an adjunct professor at Faculdade de Letras UFMG also. Uh, he's also a faculty member of the graduate program in linguistic studies at the same university. And he's co the coordinator of the program specialization in language technology and teaching. Currently, he's, uh, today he's talking to us from Sydney, where he's a visiting fellow at Macquarie University. And his research interests are language and technology and English teaching. Our second guest speaker is Professor Daniel de Mello Ferraz from uh, USP. He holds a doctoral degree from the English Linguistics and Literary Studies program at USP. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor there, uh, and he works at the Department of Letras Modernas and in English Linguistic and, and at the English Linguistic and Literary Studies program. Um, his research interests are new literacies, new technologies, critical and visual literacy. The session is organized uh, like this. Each speaker will talk for about 30 minutes. And after the presentations, they will address some of the questions that the audience can pose using the chat options. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, both speakers and on behalf of the English graduate program, at Ulski, where I work, and uh, the Department of Modern Languages, uh, where Professor Alison Gonçalves works. Maybe I forgot to say my name, I'm Rosane Silveira. And uh, we will start then with uh, Professor Ronaldo Gomes. Thank you all for being here with us tonight. Um, uh, yes, I think my microphone is open. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yes, uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, actually, it's morning here, as uh, Rosani has mentioned before. And uh, it's a pleasure to participate in such a innovative and uh, transformative uh, event. And you, would, you will get what I mean by transformative in a few minutes. Uh, first of all, I will share my screen uh, with my presentation. Okay. Okay. So uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, Drs. Rosane Silveira and Alison Gonçalves for inviting me to talk about an issue that has been in my research agenda for the last years and that I'm so interested in. Uh, as a young researcher, I must confess it's an honor to share the table with you all here. Uh, I must also say that I really enjoyed this innovative format 
uh, of this event. I believe we are kind of saturated uh, and overwhelmed uh, with the great amount of lectures, also called as lives, uh, conducted uh, during this period of the pandemic. And I hope this event can inspire other events organizers. Uh, so when I was invited to participate uh, in this event, I was, as I was asked uh, to answer the following question. Uh, can technology be incorporated in regular school classrooms? Uh, and by the way, you can download my presentation if you click on, if you go to this link here, or you can, you can also use the QR code, okay? Uh, and all the references are hyperlinked there and you can click and access the, the authors I'm gonna quote here. Uh, so this question, uh, it is a yes or no question, right? So we must infer, uh, infer that uh, there are some teachers and students who believe that's possible and others who believe that's not possible. Uh, and based on my experience as a, as a speaker and as a teacher and as a teacher educator, uh, I feel that's exactly how must, must, uh, how must people feel, uh, doubtful, uncertain, unsure, and undecided. Uh, unfortunately, we're not educated to teach in such terms. Uh, so my intention here tonight is to show you, is to answer that question with a big yes, okay? Uh, and in, the, in this presentation, I will try to justify my answer and I hope I can convince you, okay? Uh, so as Rosani has said, I'm Ronaldo and I'm a professor at UFMG and I work in the areas of language and technology. Uh, not long ago, I was also a high school teacher. So my talk here is based on my experience inside regular school classrooms uh, and on the learning, and, and also based on the learning network I've been establishing throughout my professional career. Uh, so therefore, these are, these are not my ideas, okay? Uh, but the knowledge I've been co-constructing with inspiring researchers, some colleagues and my students. And I'm, I'm sure uh, I'll leave this event with more nodes in my network. Um, so to organize my presentation, I have sectioned my talk into four parts, right? First, I'll briefly talk about the concept of technology. Then I'll discuss what technology integration is and explore the levels of technology adoption in the classroom. Uh, after that, I'll present frameworks uh, that can guide us in planning and implementing uh, learning projects. And finally, I'll raise some, some red flags uh, to call your attention to some problematic issues uh, concerning technology issue, technology use, sorry. So first of all, technology. Uh, this is a very buzz word nowadays. Uh, I mean, it has, it has always been. Uh, I always like to start my presentations with the definitions of technology because I think it's a very polysemic word which, te which tends to be understood in a narrow sense sometimes. So we can see here two senses. Uh, one, which focuses on the industrial and commercial aspect and another one about the use of knowledge to implement things, to achieve goals. So we have those two senses of technology. Uh, according to Agar 2009, technology is a confused word. And it doesn't say confusing, but confused word. Uh, and this confusion can help us understand humanity's history. So etymologically, technology has its roots in the European, Indo-European root tech, a term that probably referred to the building of wooden houses. Uh, from tech comes the Greek techne, uh, initially skills of working with wood, but soon broadened to specialized expertise, know-how, knowledge of how to make 
things that would otherwise not exist. So uh, in the 18th century, technology, uh, technology, right? Uh, the German uh, word started to be, uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I think I had a problem here. I'm sorry, guys, it was not planned. I'll share my screen again. So can you see my screen now? Yeah, yes, yes, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, I was here, right? So uh, technology as a German word began to be used to describe a discipline devoted to the systematic description of handicrafts and industrial arts and uh, technology, uh, the German was a form of elite uh, systematic knowledge. Uh, the use of term technology uh, was then uh, used by the American Jacob Bigelow in the title of his book called Elementals of Technology. And it was uh, a borrowing from this German label. What happens was that uh, the technology po began popular when it was used in the MIT, right? Uh, even if it had been adopted uh, as little more than a term, uh, sufficiently erudite or and foreign uh, to convey intellectual authority, right? So technology entered the 20th century as the science of the industrial and uh, technology is uh, uh, now a brand like term. And my idea is here is to show you that technology is not that uh, elite and industrial and uh, erudite uh, comp uh, component. It's something that it's very common and ordinary that we use in our daily lives. For instance, writing is a cultural te technology that has been in, that has been influenced by the creation of and evolutions of other technologies. Ronaldo, uh, sorry, I'm sorry okay. to interrupt you but the notes to your slides are appearing in front of them so that the audience cannot see them. I think okay. that's fixed by now. Okay, I'll, I'll do it again. So hello everyone, this is Alison speaking. <laughs> can you yes, see my notes? Yeah, yeah, yes. we can see your notes. Mm -hmm. Now okay. we can see your presentation. Okay. I, I think I'll, I'll, I know what happened. Okay, so uh, so the the alf the alphabet, for example, was uh, influenced by uh, uh, so as as technologies evolve evolve. Uh, For example, uh, here. So as technologies evolve, uh, our lives change. So uh, they are born out of a purpose, right? Uh, and the best technological breakthroughs aim for convenience. And certainly technology has made people's lives easier. Uh, and the emergence of one technology does not eliminate the older one. So here we have, for example, the evolution of technologies right from the candle to the lamp. And I mean, the lamp did not eliminate the candles. Actually, poor candles, they're so undervalued 
uh, and underestimated, right? But when uh, the power goes out, uh, we go immediately look, look, go looking crazy for the candles, right? I'm sorry, guys. I think I have a problem here. Okay, so uh, this was just to show you that technology only became a common word in the second half of the 20th century. And by then the damage was done. And the, the conceptual confusion meant that the term could be used in either broad or narrow senses, sometimes embracing cultural or social components, and sometimes reduced uh, to mere tools and mere tools or means to ends. Okay, so uh, as I said, these both uh, senses of technology and uh, one is more broad and the other one is more narrow. And my proposition here today is for us to think of, of technology in this broader sense. So, but what interests us here is the educational technology, right? Uh, and educational technology is an abstract concept or a field of practice. And according to the Association of, for Educational Communications and Technology, educational technology is the study and ethical practice of facilitating learning and improving performers, performance by creating, using, and managing appropriate technological processes and resources. So as you can see here, uh, there, this definition of educational technology has four parts and I highlighted them in different colors. So you could see them better. And these are the four parts of educational technology. First, it is a study and an ethical practice. So educational technology is not a tool. And sometimes we tend to uh, confuse uh, technology and tools, right? Uh, tools are technologies, but educational technology is a study and a field of practice, right? And too often we ask how to do. So, but I need, we, we also need to ask why we should do. So a, a technology is educational if it can facilitate learning and improve uh, performance. Uh, it is used for creating, using, and managing. Uh, in the past, those three uh, aspects, aspects were very separate. Uh, there was a person that created uh, the technology, another one that used, and the teacher was the manager. And nowadays we have what we call producage because with the advance of technologies, we can produce things. We can produce and use. So we, we become creators and managers and users uh, at the same time. So for example, with a telephone in our hands, we can create our videos, edit them and upload them and everybody becomes, so these, these frontiers uh, are somehow blurred. And uh, pro they are processes and resources. So the primary focus uh, is on learning and performance and the secondary focus on technological processes and resources. So uh, as I always say to my students, uh, sometimes they say, ah, I wanna, I wanna create a class about YouTube. So first of all, you, you need to think about what you want your students to learn. And after that, you're going to choose your tool. So uh, when thinking about educational technology, we first need to focus on learning. And after that, we, we need to search the tools that we are going to use to achieve that educational goal. 
So, and although tools are not our main focus here, they are very important because we need to, um, uh, to know the tools in order to use them, right? Uh, and our research group at UFMG, uh, we have published uh, two ebooks. They're free, right? Uh, you can upload, you can download them uh, for free. They were published by Editora Parabola. And in this book, we selected a uh, hundred tools uh, in total that can be used uh, for educational purposes. They were not designed uh, for educational purposes, but we as educators uh, analyzed them and we listed some uh, potentials, uh, some possibilities for action in the language classroom. So uh, they are great resources and you can download them uh, for free, you you can use your QR code now, or you can just go to the website of Parabola Editorial, and they're there, they're free, so you can use them. So it's good to have this uh, menu of tools in hand uh, when designing and in, and creating your projects, because after uh, selecting and thinking carefully about your objectives you can then uh, select your tools that will, will help uh, your students, that will facilitate uh, their learning. Okay, and a lot, the, the question here is about uh, in technology integration, right? Um, so uh, integration, um, again, is the acting of bringing together the parts of a whole, right? It has to do with renewal, restoration, uh, to make it whole. And uh, uh, a very nice part of this definition is this anti-discrimination sense, right? Uh, uh, opposed to segregation. So when we talk about uh, in technology integration, we are going against uh, segregation, right? And, uh, when we talk about tech, uh, technology integration, it does not happen like that. So it is a process and many authors have dedicated their research to uh, investigate more uh, this path towards adopting uh, or integrating a technology. I brought here um, uh, a framework designed by Rogers. It was not the Rogers who created the theory of diffusion of innovation. Uh, by the way, it's a good reference. You can Google him. Uh, this Rogers I'm that I'm quoting here is Patricia Rogers, right? Uh, she published in 2003, these levels of technology adoption. So uh, according to her, there are five levels uh, of technology adoption. So first, the first one is familiarization is the basic exposure to a, to a new technology, right? And then uh, after this exposure, we start using. So teachers use the new technology in the classroom. So, uh, and then uh, the integration uh, level uh, takes place. And the integration level, according to her, has two stages. First of all, teachers use the technology by choice rather than by other suggestion, okay? Uh, and then a re-examination of the teaching and learning context takes place, right? So first of all, we need to, to get exposed to it, use, and then a, a re-examination uh, of the teaching and learning context takes place. Uh, a lot of teachers are uh, afraid sometimes of using or integrating technologies in their in their classrooms because they think they don't uh, dominate the technology or they uh, they can't teach uh, like that but it is a stage you know so after integration it comes the reorientation and then a new emphasis on teaching and learning uh, 
uh, happens rather than a focus on the technology. So in the first moments, in the first stages, we, we, we tend to focus uh, so much on the technology itself. But then after we are, have it integrated in our practice, our focuses, our focus shifts, uh, and we put the emphasis on the teaching and learning, right? And we we go for towards evolution, which is when teachers are able to cope with change and have skills to adapt newer technologies as needed. Uh, in this world of digital technologies, for example, uh, technologies they appear and disappear very easily. So a technology that today is free and tomorrow it, it can be paid. So a teacher who, uh, who has uh, integrated technology into his or her practice uh, and uh, works towards evolution can, uh, is able to cope with those changes that are very dynamic in the digital environment. Uh, so uh, technology integration is a matter of learning ecology. Uh, why? Uh, I, for the past uh, few years, I've been working with learning ecology, uh, the, the ecological perspective in language learning. And in the ecological perspective, we see learners, we, I mean, we see individuals embedded in their environments and we, we analyze their relationships uh, that happen when they interact with this environment. Uh, so an ecological approach aims to look at the learning process, uh, the actions and activities of teachers and learners. Uh, the multi-layered nature of interaction and language use in all their complexity and as a network of interdependencies among all the elements in the setting. So uh, when, I, when I say that we need that technology integration is a matter of uh, ecology, I, I mean that uh, we need to, we need to uh, focus not on the object itself, not on the technology itself, but on the relationship we establish with the technology. So here are some um, key words uh, of learning ecology. And I highlighted two words, two important words here. So relationships. So in an ecological perspective, we focus on the relationship uh, rather than the object. So our focus is the relationship that the, we establish with this environment. And also it, learning in this perspective is, a, uh, is about agency. So uh, we need to create uh, learning experiences uh, to our students that in which they have an environment uh, which is sufficiently free uh, for them to act. Right, so that's why I always say that we need to invite them to participate in uh, in the development of our projects, uh, especially uh, concerning technology uh, that our students will always know more than us. It is also a matter of social justice, as I said before. Uh, when, when we talk about integration, we go against uh, discrimination, right? Um, so this is uh, a, a quote from Professor, Professor Vani Kensky from USP. And she says that school education has to be more than a mere certified assimilation of knowledge, much more than preparing consumers or training people to use information and communicational tech technologies. The school needs to take on the role of educating citizens for the complexity of the world and the challenges it poses, preparing conscious citizens to critically analyze the excess of information and change in order to deal with successive innovations and transformations of knowledge in all areas. I won't uh, talk more about that. I believe Professor uh, Daniel Ferraz is going to uh, go deeper on this uh, uh, on this topic, right? 
And uh, we need to go beyond uh, the method. Uh, sometimes we go looking for the, for the method uh, to use or to, to implement or to integrate technologies in our classroom. But uh, I believe that we should focus on a post method teacher education. And when we talk about post method, we talk about an awareness that as long as we are caught up in the web of method, we will continue to get entangled in an un unending search for an, un for an unavailable solution. So there is not one solution, right? Uh, so this post method uh, is, an aware is an awareness uh, that such a uh, search drives us to continually recycle and repackage the same old ideas and an awareness that not, nothing short of breaking the cycle can savage the situation. So uh, nowadays with this dynamic world we live in with the amount of theories that have been uh, designed, uh, we should take advantages of all of them and when necessary. So this uh, critical persp perspective and uh, not focusing on only one method is very important in my uh, opinion. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about some frameworks. Uh, a lot of frameworks have been designed, uh, frameworks of technology integration, and I like them because they guide and orient our practices in the classroom uh, in a way that the technology use is not guided by our intuition, okay? Uh, of our belief that such a technology is good or bad. So those frameworks are, are nice because of that. So there are many frameworks available. If you, if you Google uh, frameworks, technology integration, you'll find a lot of them. So, but today here, I brought two of them just to show you what those frameworks are and how they orient our work in the classroom. First, the first one is the TPAC, uh, and you can find a lot of material available on the internet. And this framework uh, comprehends uh, three types of knowledge. It says that we must have a technological knowledge, a pedagogical knowledge, and the content knowledge. And uh, this framework relies on the intersections between those three uh, knowledges. So now I will play a video for you that will explain this framework in two minutes. So I hope you can listen to it. Here's TPAC in two minutes. For more information, visit tpac.org. So first we have to ask, what is it? Well, TPAC is a framework that combines three knowledge areas, our technological knowledge, content knowledge, and our pedagogical knowledge. And it looks at how they work together to increase student motivation and to make the content more accessible to students. We look at the content as the what. It's the subject matter we're teaching, like ecology, music, algebra, health, geometry, or art history, to name a few. Then we look at our pedagogical knowledge. It's the how. Every teacher has tools, so let's put them to use. Are we going to be using direct instruction? Will this be inquiry-based, group discussions? How are we going to make the content more accessible by the way we present it to our students? Then we look at selecting the appropriate technology because it's the partner. What tool will we select to make the content more accessible to the students while supporting the pedagogical strategy which we've identified will help to deliver this information to students? We must identify those support features to really help us use technology to reach our outcome. As we understand them individually, we can start to see overlaps. Our TP knowledge allows us to understand how we're making the content more accessible. Our TC knowledge allows us to identify the affordances of pairing the appropriate technology to the content. And our PC knowledge allows us to identify the affordances of pairing the appropriate pedagogical strategies with the content. TPAC comes from the overlapping in that center spot, or as we refer to it as the sweet spot, when all three knowledge areas work together.
It's crucial to remember that surrounding this is the context that's you and your students. This may look differently when you walk into classrooms because at the heart of TPAC is meeting students' needs. So, Rosani and Allison, could you listen to the video? Yes, we'll listen oh. to it very well. Thank you. So this is the TPAC, uh, people like it a lot. Uh, actually, it makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, the integrations between those three knowledges and they illustrate uh, what I was telling you uh, in a little, uh, not long ago that we first need to think about our uh, learning objectives and then select the, select the technologies that we'll use to achieve this goal, right? So I like, the, I like these frameworks because they guide our work in the classroom. And because sometimes I have the impression that people use technologies because they like the technologies, not because the technologies are useful or powerful, right? So uh, using those frameworks or at least thinking about them is important because of that. Uh, another uh, framework, actually, this is my favor, favorite, is the SAMR. Is, it was created by Dr. Puente Dura in 2006. And basically it has two levels, the enhancement level and the transformation level. That's why I was saying at the beginning that this event here is transformative. And you understand what, the, what it is transformative in this sense. So it has four levels, okay? The SAMR uh, framework. So again, I will show you a video that I hope it will explain you uh, faster. I think it, it will explain better than me right now. So take a look. This is the SAMR model in 120 seconds. The SAMR model is a framework that provides a lens for viewing technology integration in the classroom. The first level is substitution or the idea that a block is a block no matter where it is or how you access it. This would be like using Google Docs as any other word processor. The new tech replaces the old tech, but it does not change the task. The next level is augmentation. At this level, the tech is still a substitute, but provides more functionality as students work to complete the same task. The ability to share your Google Doc in one click and the fact that it saves to the cloud automatically and provides you access from anywhere is an increase in functionality. The next level is modification. Here the ball really gets rolling because the technology is used to redesign parts of the task and transform student learning. Students collaborating on one Google Doc and using the comment feature to provide instant feedback is an example of modification. The final level of SAMR is redefinition. At this level, we're able to design and create new tasks that were once unimaginable. By shifting our perspective from technology just being another block or substitute, we're able to truly start imagining the possibilities. An example of redefinition would be connecting to a classroom across the world through students sharing Google Docs. They would each write their own narrative of the same historical event, using the chat and comment section to discuss the differences. Then students would use the Voice Comments app to discuss the differences they noticed and embed this in their class website as a culture walk. To recap, substitution is the same task, new tech replaces old tech. Augmentation is the same task, but the tech increases functionality. Modification, we're able to redesign parts of the task. Redefinition, we're able to create new tasks once unimaginable. As we move from substitution to redefinition, we're moving from enhancing to transforming student learning. Well, so as I said, this is my favorite uh, framework. Um, I think there's nothing wrong uh, in using a technology just substituting uh, an, an old to a new one. The problem is that we only, if we only do that, okay? So if we only do that, if we only use uh, PowerPoint presentations instead of uh, writing on the board, we are merely uh, substituting. We are enhancing in a way the learner experience because of the multimodal uh, resources, because of the audio, maybe of the colors but we are not transforming his or her uh, experiences. So I think that 
Um, this uh, illustration here is is really nice because in in the first stage uh, here it's when you have no tech okay if you when you don't use you have no technology and then you you wonder what's in the ocean right so we have this ocean of uh, possibilities this digital ocean and we are when we are not uh, in the ocean we just wonder what's there so at the from the moment we uh, put our step in the water we go to the substitution mode so technology acts as a direct tool uh, substitute with no functional change right and then we go deeper and we augment uh, the experience so the tech acts as a direct tool substitute with functional improvement when we go deeper we start transforming the learner experience so the technology allows for significant task redesign and we go deeper and deeper and deeper we go we have the redefinition uh, mode is when you have when you create a task that was not possible before right so the technology allows for the creation of new tasks previously previously inconceivable so these are the frameworks that i brought today they're just to show you uh, that the use of technology in the classroom the integration of technology in the in the classroom should be very carefully uh, thought and those frameworks they help us and orient us in uh, in our job of designing learner experiences so now i will raise some red flags that uh, are issues that uh, are very uh, i mean that i worry a, a lot about first of all i i see that there is a lot of there is a kind of fat fetish uh, in technology okay uh, a fat i say fetish because we focus too much on the object and i am afraid that sometimes we are collecting technologies all all around just to have a full closet so i brought this this example here of king kardashian that is known for having a, a, a huge closet full of shoes but does she really use those shoes uh so or are they are just fetish a fetish for her they are just <clears throat> an object of desire. So we should be careful uh, not to go uh, selecting and using technologies without a purpose, right? Uh, another thing we should be careful, um, uh, there are there is a lot of marketing scams, uh, like, uh, for example, the e-board. People love e-boards, but sometimes they use the e-boards just as a marketing uh, feature to advertise uh, schools. So to recruit student language schools, they do that a lot. They use the digital label as a marketing just to recruit students. And in a way, uh, parents, uh, they, they, they buy that because they think they are providing the best education to their to their children so we should uh, be careful about that if if the if it digital is not being used as a label just as just a label okay uh, the technology obsession um, or technology fixation um, I like technology a lot but I think we need to 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 break a little bit uh, okay uh, sometimes we're too focused on the technology uh, for example uh, in a, imagine a classroom where students are using their phones to to talk but i mean they're they're side by side they can talk uh, to one another so we we should we should use the technology but not become very obsessed and uh fixated and also nowadays that uh we are working remotely for example 
there are some research that proves that, for example, uh, teenagers, they can only, uh, their attention time on the screen is very limited. So we should offer them other experiences besides the digital. We have other technologies that can be used and not only the digital is uh, the, the good one. And remember that it's not only about you, it's about you and your students. So you, should, you shouldn't select or integrate the technology you like. You should think, uh, of course you should know how to use, you should believe uh, in the technology, but you should think about your students. And it doesn't have, this is my message uh, today and something that I'm, that I'm advocating uh, here. It doesn't have to be digital, okay? It must be educational. So of course, digital technologies, they provide opportunities for us to design learner experiences that were, that were not possible with analogical uh, technologies. But uh, it doesn't have to be digital. If you don't have uh, digital technologies, uh, uh, in your, um, in, your, uh, in your environment, use other technologies, okay? At least they are educational, it's okay. And thank you so much. I'm sorry for the problems we had, uh, I had here in this, with my presentation, but I think we're all learning how to, how to behave and how to do this kind of stuff uh, online. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ronaldo. Can you stop sharing your screen now? Okay. We have um, two questions here and we have some comments, but I'll save them for the end because maybe there will be similar questions for Professor Daniel Gimelli. Okay. Okay. So I'll, uh, I wrote them down. Uh, they are also here on our chat and also in the Q&A function that we don't know exactly how we don't know exactly how it works, but we can try later on to see how it works, okay? Uh, okay. So now I would like to uh, ask Professor Daniel Daniel okay. to, to do his Okay. Hi, Rosani, thank you. Uh, let me also share. I'm also used, like, on, I'm, I'm more used to Google Meet. But let's see, share screen. Let's see here. Can you all see my presentation? And can you hear me well? Yes, yes, it's all working. Yes? Oh, yeah. wonderful. Okay, okay, now, yeah, your presentation. Is it is, working? Yeah. Yeah, yeah? Mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, talking about technology, I was able to follow uh, Ronaldo's presentation, but also follow the, ch the chat on YouTube. And uh, we have around 55 plus 85, around 140 um, colleagues um, watching us from all over Brazil. And I, I'd like to thank you all for being here. And my name is Daniel Ferraz. I'm from the University of Sao Paulo. And the title of my presentation is Technologies, the What's, Why's, When's, and How's. <laughs> I, of course, I'm going to raise many questions. Um, and within this lot of time of 30 minutes, I won't be able to answer all of them, but we, we have some time. Uh, later on to talk about all these what's, why's, when's, and how's. So first of all, of course, I would like to, to thank professors Rosane Silveira and Alison Gonçalves. Thank you so much. I'm honored, I'm flattered to be here um, opening this uh, Applied Linguistics Question and Answers session. Thank you, Ronaldo, for the lovely presentation. It was really, really, really insightful, brilliant. We have a lot to, to dialogue, let's say, because it's, 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 it's a little bit, it's harder to be the second one because we run the risk of the first presenter um, talking about things and you will see a lot of similarities um, to my presentation. So thank you, Ronaldo. And um, again, what uh, we were asked to talk about today, the very first day, and I'd like to say that I will be, of course, um, uh, present in all the, 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 the other days of the event. Okay, so thank you very much and congratulations for the event. 
So uh, the, the topics, let's say, is um, our technology and second language education. And this is the first day of the event of um, Federal University of Santa Catarina and Federal University of Paraná. So the outline for my presentation, I will briefly talk about the contexts. I have three main contexts, let's say, to talk to you about. And then I will talk about the what's, the why's, the when's, and the how's. And the key word here is technologies. And then I'll finish with some ideas on how to connect technologies with language education and society. Uh, I should go back here and say thank you. My, my, my niece, Luisa, she's um, uh, watching this presentation from Mogi das Cruzes. And I said, it's going to be in English, Luisa, and she's a teenager. And uh, I'm always talking to her about technology and education, asking her things, and she, she teaches me a lot of things. So, Luisa, I hope you understand and I hope you enjoy it. it she's just 16 years, uh, years old. So the first context is the locus of an enunciation. Uh, professionally speaking, I, so I am here at the University of Sao Paulo and the Faculty of Philosophy, Language, Literature and Human Sciences. But I think the main context of my presentation is this very first semester, very atypical, not normal, new normal. Now we're, we have so many names for, for this new normal. And uh, so the context is my undergraduate and my graduate classes here at USP and the challenge of the new technologies of all sorts and of all kinds. And why am I saying that? Because first of all, uh, obviously I, I, I wouldn't like to set any kind of truth here or with all the activities that I'm presenting when I finish my presentation, they are not like uh, between quotation marks formulas or to be followed, but it's really, really from my, from my from my context here, and this huge challenge, because USP, right after the pandemic, we felt this pressure, you know, to, 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 to become, you know, digital, digital professors from overnight. And uh, of course, it was not demanding or something obligatory, but we felt the pressure. So I decided to to continue the classes, to continue with the with the digital classes, but we had so many colleagues that decided not to not to go on with the classes, not to let's say accept this pressure. So I think this is a very important context. It it, it touches all of us, correct? The second context is well. And then because I'm talking about myself and when we finish, we get so nervous to finish within time. These are my contacts, okay? Uh, this is my email, this is my website. I also invite you to follow me on Instagram. I have, I'm starting a new digital educational project there. It's Dan for us with double N and also my Twitter account. Um, so um, the second context um, refers to the epistemology, so the, 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 the theories that I will present to you today. The first one, uh, I'm a member of the National Project of Literacies, Language, Culture, Education, and Technology is highlighted there, as you can see. Um, it is a like a decade project from 2009 to 2021, uh, coordinated by Professors Limario and Valkyrie Montemor. And there is a total of around 30 or more than 30 universities now, most of them public. And technologies has been one of our main topics, let's say, one of our main concerns when we talk about, it is a teacher education project. So we're, we've been discussing and debating the new literacies, multiliteracies, and digital literacies. And also my PhD involved, I investigated technology because my research was um, within the FATEX, Faculdade de Tecnologia environment. So um, there is a huge part in my research of my PhD. It's published in this book. Okay, so this is like the, let's say from where I'm speaking in terms of epistemologies from the literacies, digital literacies, multiliteracies. And the third context, of course, it's unavoidable. We cannot forget the pandemic and the, the COVID. Uh, we've been isolated. Uh, of course, some of us, some Brazilians have been isolated. Some have refused, but also the political, institutional, educational and health crisis. Uh, and these changes 
changes the game, you know, at least for me, because when you talk about education nowadays, everybody is talking about technology, especially digital technologies, internet, connectivity, digitality. So this has been the debate since the, the, the outbreak of the pandemic, okay? So based on these three contexts, let's say, I will start, yeah, I, I should start with the prompt question as Hosani mentioned uh, in the introduction, can technology be incorporated in regular school classrooms? And Ronaldo, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, we have, as I told you, we have a lot of similarities in our presentations. Uh, yes, I also agree with Ronaldo, it's a big yes. My answer is also a big yes, yeah. But it's, uh, at least for me, it is a yes, but, because when we think about the incorporation of technology in regular school classrooms, I think we should talk about number one, what? And, 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 and then of course, I'm so glad Ronaldo presented before me because uh, as you could see in his presentation, these many, many perspectives and definitions about technology. And I'm so glad you did that because I'm not going to do that, but I will invite you the reader, the, the everybody who's uh, following or attending this conference now uh, to think about technology uh, subjectively. Uh, each one of you, I'm inviting each one of you to think about what is technology for you, and then the whys, why technologies, and then when should we use technology, when should it be incorporated, and how. So I'll finish with the how, the, this very uh, practical dimension in which I am sharing with you some of my, let's say, successful, I don't like this word successful, but well, okay, this is what pops up into my mind now. Uh, the successful uh, technological activities that I've done. But I also agree with Ronaldo. It's an educational process first, and this is something that uh, it's very, very relevant and important. And as I will try to show you at the end, uh, sometimes the teacher should be able to opt not to use technology, you know, depending on the context, okay? Uh, so what I'm saying here is that it's not like a God savior, you know, uh, like Ronaldo just presented, it should be used ethically, etc. Okay, so let's go for the what's, the why's, the when's, and the how's. <laughs> um, so the first dimension, the what, what I'd like us to do now, unfortunately, we are not face to face because then it would be much more interactive. So for me, uh, carrying on this activity, it's very silent and for everybody, for, 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 for all of us. But um, I will show you some images very, very fastly. And I'll give you like two seconds for you to think about technologies uh, in, in a very subjective level. If so, which ones could be considered technologies for you? Uh, as a teacher, as a student, as a researcher, which ones could be considered new technologies for you? And what is technology for you? As I show you the images, I do this activity a lot. I love images. I work a lot with visual literacy. So uh, this is another example of things that I do. I ask students just to look at the images and talk about them. So let's start. This is going to be really, 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 really fast because I'm always worried about time. So this, these are the first two ones. I imagine you're all laughing if you recognize them, but I imagine that are, there are many, many young uh, students, you know, watching us now, like Louisa, my niece, and uh, she probably won't recognize this, but also this, okay? So again, what is technology? Do you recognize these images? Have you used them, etc. This one, compared to this one, if we were face to face, I would ask you to talk to somebody next to you, or I would ask you to jot down uh, some connections, okay? The next one, or something, sorry, you can write in the chat. I was following the chat on YouTube and I was also following the chat on Zoom. So you can always write the chat. Uh, this is the funny part of my presentation, let's say. Um, this is, something I always talk to my students, especially this telephone here, many of them do not recognize, right? Um, this telephone. Um, so this one, so 
just as an anecdote, I had my first mobile phone when I was 19 or 20 years old. So I'm from another generation, from, from, from many of our students uh, with us right now. Let's move on. So the game is think about uh, your connections to technology. You can think about words. You can write comments on the chat. If you uh, recognize all of these images as technologies or not, or like Ronaldo just mentioned, what kinds of technologies, right? Another one. Yeah, this is the computer of the first World Wide Web. Correct me if I'm wrong. I saw Vera Menezes. Vera, good evening. Thank you so much. I'm flattered you're here. I also saw Ana Duboc, Ana Karina. All of you have been researching technology, but the first World Wide Web. And then um, uh, this is something more recent. Yes. And the next one. Yeah, I have some images now for you and these challenge if you recognize all of these S technology. Also this one. So I invite you to write and to, to uh, comment on the chat. Hi, Kiria, good evening. So nice to see you here as well. It's so nice we are here alone but uh, we, we, have, we have this synergy. I feel that you're all with me right now. So tell me if this is technology for you. Clarissa, Jordan. Clarissa, I think this is for you. Tell me if this is technology from Arueira. I took this from, from uh, Instagram and Maybe this is a challenge and the provocation. Tell me if this is technology for you from Breaking Taboo, another page from Instagram. And I think I'm about to finish this uh, first part, the what's. Tell me if this, is uh, if this is technology for you, what can you recognize and what do you interpret from this image? Specifically this image, I, would, I, I shall go back to this image um, in this presentation, okay? So try to take a picture of this image and keep it in your memory. All right, so let's move on. Um, second dimension, the whys. So why should we use technology? And Ronaldo said, again, in which context, right? So why is technology so important and why is it sometimes not so important? For you to not, for us not to consider like this God perspective, the savior, it can save us all. Okay. So according to Kathy Ann Mills, uh, we're experiencing right now a, di a digital turn. That is the increased attention to uh, new literacy practices in digital environments across a variety of social contexts, such as workplaces and workplaces, educational, economic, and recreational sites. So. Uh, even if we consider, of course, there's the discussion of inclusion and exclusion, right? And uh, of course, I always talk about that with my students as well, because uh, the, the data is uh, around uh, 3.8, 4. billion inhabitants have some kind of digitality, but the other 3 billion uh, do, uh, do not have it. So, of course, uh, we have to be care very careful with these uh, generalizations. But we have this feeling that there is this digital turn. And even if you uh, cannot access or you, you cannot like uh, pay for an internet connection, this is a big discussion right now with the online classes, the virtual classes, uh, you know what's going on. You see it on television or you steal the, the internet from, from a coffee shop from, and then you, you know what's going on. So I think Kathy Ann Mills is talking about this digital turn um, um, based upon James Poe G. And uh, this is something for us to think about. And also uh, she talks about this idea that scholars within new literacy studies, 
they have drawn attention to these innovative and productive potentials of literacy practices, as uh, Ronaldo uh, gave us some examples, right? And, um, and thank you, Ronaldo, I learned a lot with some of your frameworks. And in electronic environments that children use both in and out of school practices. So um, this is interesting. This is something I talk to my, to my niece all the time, Louisa. They, these young uh, generation of learners and students, they use all of this uh, uh, outside the schools, uh, the school walls. But when we get into the, the classroom, um, technology, it seems like, um, like uh, the, the old wine, new bottles, as somebody mentioned here in the chat. It's something that you're, you're not writing anymore, but then you're just uh, using the PowerPoint. So the PowerPoint class. Here at USP, we have many, many students complaining that the, the professor uh, opens up the camera and then gets the notes and read the notes. Sometimes not even paying attention, like not even caring about this. And like he's reading like this, blah, 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 like reading for two hours. So is this, a good use, a potential use of technology, a technology, this is something we need to think about. Um, so then, uh, still thinking about the whys, um, uh, Langshire and Noble will talk about this mindset continue, uh, continuum, uh, Cope and Calances, and many literacy scholars about this idea of the mindset one, still very traditional, based upon uh, the linearity, but also moving and of course, this is not something, it's like a continuum move, move, moving back and moving forward mindset too. And here I'm asking, I'm, invite, I'm, I'm inviting you to think along with me, what, would, what will be <laughs> mindset number three? Um, so this, is, this uh, has to do with this idea uh, that Ana Paula Duboc and myself, we had this research for some time, for some years, and uh, we, and this is also Valkyrie de Montemor. We're we're talking about this linear typographic society. So why we need to talk about technology? Okay, why do we need to talk about technology? Because here in this very traditional kind of society, of this perspective of society, the characteristics are centralization, individual authorship, concentration, normatization, and the practices are linear based on writing. Of course, this is never going to be extinguished or eliminated, but we have this typographic, this post typographic society in which uh, distribution, um, collaborative authorship, sharing performance and multimodal practices. And here I'm emphasizing the visual practices, the highly visual practices from the social media. All of these characteristics, they are at our doors. They are at the doors of our classrooms. So this is why I think we should discuss technologies. Even if we don't want to, our students, they're coming to us with this kind of mindset. This is something that I believe in. This is something that I experience. I can give you many, many examples in the, in the debate later on or in the discussion, but this is something that I, that I've, especially now, I have been a teacher and professor for 26 years now, but for the past 10 years, I have experienced this huge need to discuss technology uh, with our students, with my students. Um, so we're moving on to the third dimension, which is when. And here I have a video for you. I'm not sure, maybe I could ask for Alison's help, the God, what is it, Clarissa, the God, the God of technology. Uh, Alison, could you just confirm if you see my new, the new screen, the, the YouTube? Yes, maybe. Yes, yes. Yes, can. yes. Oh, sorry, but then... okay. okay, thank you. So this is funny babies talking. I love babies videos. So I'll try to show you this one. Let me just close this. Okay, it's just one minute. I'm gonna show you because of time. But for us, this is the introduction for my talk on when should we use technology um, in the classroom.
<laughs> okay, I, I will show you, I'll send you the link later on. I can send you the, the slides as well. But the, this video, like they're toddlers, they're really, really babies and they're already, yeah, we don't, we, we, we don't know if they're really, really talking or if they're pretending because they see their parents. But the idea here for me is when we talk about when, the key word is the context, I think. Um, so, um, when we think about when should we use technology, we should first of all, and beforehand, we should think about the context. Because, for example, if I'm teaching children, or I don't know if uh, we have students teaching, you know, really, really young children, and uh, under this pressure, I have, a, I have one of my students, she told me right now from here from USP, she said, Daniel, I have to teach one, two, three year olds and their parents are, you know, beside them, beside the computer. And it's really, really, uh, so how should this be done, right? Also, when you think about uh, children, uh, what is the context? Because, you know, uh, like teaching here in Sao Paulo is pretty different from teaching the children in Spirit Santo. And if you narrow down uh, Spirit Santo, if you're teaching in the, the area of Grande Vitoria, it's really different from Cariacica, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you narrow down to our very, very, our own experiences. And this is something that the teacher should negotiate, the public school teacher or the private school teacher, the regular teacher should negotiate with the coordination and the, and everybody from the from the from this from the school. Also, when we talk about adolescents, okay. Also, when we talk about um, uh, adult education, and also when we talk about Asia, for example. So here we have just four uh, uh, main examples of different contexts. So when should we use technology? Is highly dependent on the context, and. To try to answer the question. So again, I'm inviting everybody to think about their own views of technology. This is first of all, and Ronaldo also invited us to do the same and to investigate your own context uh, before you decide to prepare a pedagogical activity, uh, a pedagogical practice that includes technology. But even so, I do believe it is possible in every class. I think it's possible in every pedagogical project and especially now with the pandemic. Of course here, um, and this is something we can debate later on, I am not excluding the talk of inclusion exclusion. Uh, I can give you the example, for example, I taught so, uh, sociolinguistics this semester. It's a big group here at, at Fefelech and we have 45 students. So I had 25 to 30 students um, uh, being able to finish the, 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 the term because the others, they had no connectivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So of course, all of these should be discussed, but even so, I, 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 I think it's a huge opportunity and I see a lot of potentiality using it in a critical way, in a contextual way and everything that I've been saying so far. So this is my suggestion, of course. And then I'm about to finish my presentation with the fourth dimension and the how my intention here is, so I talked about what is technology. I talked about why should we use technology? Um, I kind of defended that when, kind of almost always, but so let me, let me share with you some of my experiences uh, from my undergraduate and graduate classes, because all of these activities, I, I do not differentiate um, um, undergraduate and graduate classes, meaning that even in post-graduation, I've been using a lot of dynamics and digital dynamics with my, with my students. So the first one, I think, uh, social media. Um, I think we have varied ways of um, 
varied ways of working with social media. And uh, if we're thinking about the public school teacher, we can, we can think about this idea of um, working with students in English. So any of these social media can be, work, uh, can be worked with in English from any level, basic level, from any level of, uh, of fluency. But also, uh, I, so I think that just by including social media in our pedagogical practice is something that um, will, will be something, it's something that will be closer to our students. We can use social media for discussion. Uh, we can use for critical language education, uh, like depending on the topics, depending on the materials you've, you're, choos you're, you're choosing, uh, also the discussion you want to put forward. So all of this, for me, uh, can be explored uh, within the critical language education perspective. And then I see a lot of similarities. I'm just calling critical language, but Honato is calling something else. But you see a lot of similarities in our presentations right? Uh, innovative and creative ways of using language and students' social practices. So I think that when, even if you, if you're, if you don't want to use social media as a pedagogical practice, but the discussion is really, really important, especially with adolescents uh, and young, um, young adults. Uh, this is an example. Uh, I do every semester, every term, I use the Padlet uh, with my students, and I use a text by Stanovsky, uh, 2017, a wonderful text that he's talking about remix. Uh, the text is Remix Racism. And um, so then after this discussion, I ask, so we go to the lab, and I ask students to produce memes uh, or to reproduce memes that they find um, interesting from their, from their social media. So I have this collection of memes that students, they also created one about me, as you can see here. So it's a very, very interesting um, uh, production, but also next class, we talk about the memes when possible. So uh, very, very interesting. The next one is about technology and visual literacy. So I started my talk with this very fast activity of showing you images and asking you to interpret them. Interpret them. So I think this is very, very productive. Uh, it involves technology, but in a different way, uh, definitely very differently from the, the reading of, of a text that I produced. Um, because it is interactive and it works with interpretation. So it's pretty simple. I know that everybody does that, but uh, I'm also, when I was preparing this talk, I was also, I was also thinking about the teacher, the pre-service teacher, but the in-service teacher. So the ones that are already uh, working and uh, I, I thought of bringing some ideas to everybody. So show, so show some, some images to students and ask for their interpretation. And for me, this can be used in pre-service teacher education at the university, but also in service teacher education, regular schools, and also ch uh, th uh, children education. So we've done this before. Uh, this is just one example. I, so I wanted to talk about dichotomies um, binarisms and polarization with my students, especially talking about the, these very severe, uh, frustrating and sad times we're living in Brazil now uh, with this uh, government. So I always like to bring this discussion, but I'd like to, sh I, I wanted to talk to them about this idea that polarization is something philosophical. It's something that is intrinsic in our societies, especially Western societies because, because of positivism, because of the enlightenment. So I wanted to bring more discussion with them using images. So I offered them all of these images and uh, here we talked about Sao Paulo, this uh, two very controversial projects, one from Doria, the governor now, but the Beautify, and the trans citizenship from, from Haddad, very different uh, uh, city projects, let's say, going to very opposite directions. 
And then we have all of these discussions here talking about mass media, uh, main mass media, but also alternative media. Um, here we, we talked about the United States and their positionings uh, when they compared the former president and the current president. Um, race, also uh, the refugees, immigration, migration. So I, I tried to show them all of these dichotomies and um, invited the students to deconstruct all of these dichotomies. How, which narratives would be told otherwise if we didn't have the extremes? What, what would them be? Right, and we have very, very interesting discussions just by the this input, this triggering from images. The third example, and I promise I'm about to finish, technologies and digital, uh, the digital games, but also physical games, and this is a, a work that I uh, I carried out with one of my master students, Pedro Santana. Uh, uh, digital games and language education. We need to talk more. more uh, we need to talk more about this encounter. So the idea here is to bring really to play in the classroom with the students if they have mobile phones, or to bring computers, take them to the lab if that's possible, or ask them to play at home if it's possible. So this is in city, and uh, we my student had this experience that I'd like to share with you. But I would also like to point out that when I was at the Federal University of Espiritu Santo, I worked a lot with digital games, uh, discussing digital games and also inviting students to bring me games to teach me, to tell, to tell me what they do. So these are some images of the, of the, of the students playing. This is a public school, uh, a basic education. And very interestingly, um, at the end of the project, because they were not able to do to design a digital software or something like that, they decided to do something very physical. So they produced games. Look how lovely and how uh, interesting the production of students. So they, they produced games and all of these games, they could be transformed. They could be turned, uh, turned into digital games, of course. So they were talking about the neighborhood, and this is Pedro, my, my master's student, the teacher um, uh, in this project. And my uh, another contribution, technologies and the body. And here, remember, I asked you to, mem to memorize that image. So here, this idea, a lot connected to post-humanism studies, very, very interesting, really, really wonderful, this relationship between the, the body and the machine. And uh, uh, according to some researchers and some scholars, we our own bodies, they are capable of dealing with technology, but they are also technologies. They are human technologies. So there's a lot of technological principles within our bodies and outside of our bodies. So this is something interesting for us to think about. And I, and I highly, I totally agree with Ronaldo. Because when we think about this educational perspective, sometimes we can use uh, alternative ways like Pedro did with his students because they could not, uh, they, they could not afford, they, they didn't have the structure, the technological structure to design something, but this cannot be, uh, this cannot prevent our use of discussing technology or using. So this is my last um, sharing of activity. And this is, um, um, this is the human camera. And this is, uh, this, it's much more explained in this chapter, Motilitrosis, Epistemologies, Ontologies, or Pedagogies. And the human camera, uh, this is an image, I, I really don't like this image very much, but this is the one that I found to explain. But anyways, <laughs> talking about race. Um, so here the idea is that student A is the photographer and the student B is the human camera. So I did this in Espiritu Santo. I did this here in Sao Paulo. I take all my students to the garden. I take all my students outside the, the classroom and I take them to a green place and I ask them to, I ask them to, uh, to do a, a pair work in which one student will take the other student and take a picture, 
like this student, I would be the human camera. One, two, three, click. One, two, three, click. And they take that picture with that image. So I am the human camera. I will register here in my cognition. I ask students to take a photograph of that frame. And then I, I, I ask them to come back. Uh, everybody comes back. And then, and then they send me all of these images and we have a discussion about this activity and how uh, it involves technology as well because of the mobile phones and the images and how, uh, how students felt their emotions when they were doing all this, uh, the, uh, this activity. Very, very interesting, lovely activity. I love this one uh, to talk about multiliteracies. Um, gesture, body, visual, speaking, emotions, sensations. So it's everything involved. And this is the result, some examples, of course, of the images that students showed me. Lovely, wonderful, very artistic photographs. This was in Vitoria, uh, Federal Spirit Santo. I love this one. And uh, students comment like, I don't know my own uh, campus because the images are so artistic, so different that sometimes we don't pay attention to uh, the images surrounding us. Um, so the final considerations, I hope I am on time, Alison and Hosani. <laughs> I was really, really fast because I'm always worried about time. And uh, so the final considerations, the first one, I'm using the Bach and Ferraz again. Uh, what is it to teach in the digital era? So the, it, it's very complex, I think, because here we're talking about the student's ability to work collaboratively, so collaboration, the ability to the student's ability to distribute knowledge, student's ability to manipulate, like positively, uh, positively manipulate, create and remix texts, uh, student's ability to interpret views of the world, different views of the world position themselves critically and the linguistic aspects, of course, but also the cultural, local, global aspects of the teaching. So my invitation and my suggestion here is that when we are under this pressure, especially now, uh, let me go back here. When we are under pressure, especially now to talk about, uh, to implement uh, to implement uh, technology in our classrooms, I think uh, we should send this slide <laughs> to our coordinator and say, look, let's talk about it because it is something very complex. It has to be done wisely. It has to be with epistemological groundings. It's not something like, okay, let's do it. Open the Google Meet, open Zoom and let's do it. Because a lot of things are involved. A lot of things are at stake. Okay, at least for me and for from the research that I've been carrying on. Uh, as I'm about to finish, I'm going to skip this, this uh, the, pris the prisms dimensions. I can send you all this. And I'm going to finish with, with this. I'll give you like three seconds for you to, to see and interpret my final <laughs> images. I'm trying to open this here, yes. Okay, so that I can see myself. So um, lots of the Balkan Fahas today, but uh, in 2018, we were very worried, Ana Paula and myself, with the elections of you know whom. So, um, so we, back there in time, we were talking and we were very worried about all of these movements and return of the outright, this homogeneity, homogeneity, consensus, standardization, universalism, passivity, militarization, and authoritarianism. And unfortunately, uh, what we have witnessed so far is the, the overabundance of all this, uh, an over return of all this, unfortunately, this is being you know, thrown at our faces, especially educators, especially Brazilian educators, especially teacher educators, and why we should always open for the debate, why we should always, uh, why, okay, let's talk about technology. Yes, let's talk about technology, but let's also talk about all of the surroundings in relation to this 
pressure of turning classes overnight into something technological. Because this is something, this is the background talk, uh, at least for me, uh, in, in, in times of, of, of pandemic. Um, and um, I will finish with this, this post that I, that I uploaded on Instagram uh, this morning, uh, because I thought it was so connected to my proposal uh, the proposal of my talk today. I posted it in Portuguese, but I will, I will translate it. So the idea of the chover no molhado, it never rains, but it pours. Uh, I will be redundant on purpose when I say that we cannot accept the cuts in relation to quality public education, renowned research agencies in Brazil, not only uh, in the humanities, but also in the hard sciences, the medical and biological fields. So we cannot accept these cuts. This has a lot to do with technology because if we are under pressure to technologize, yeah, why are you cutting funds from agencies, from research? So how do you want, how do you want us? How do you expect us to move on uh, without financing, without support? And uh, so I wrote here in the comments that I'm, I'm not only sad, I am frustrated with these uh, uh, fractures, this uh, terrible no words project of this current Brazilian government um, uh, trying to destroy, to destroy public education in Brazil. And uh, with this ideological whatever, uh, we should not be talking about this ideological part or side of nucleus of the government. You know, if anything is ideological, being silent is ideological. So absurdities we've been experiencing, and I think they have a lot to do with technology. Just as an example, we can do a lot of activism online if we want to and uh, share our ideas with society, not only within university, but also with society, with people that are, are calling us uh, all names possible, okay? So thank you very much. Thank you for listening. I hope I was on time. My, my suggestion is for my talk that you think about the what, the why's, the when's and the how's for each one of you uh, when you start using and preparing pedagogical classes in your, in your schools, universities. And um, thank you very, very much. These are my contacts again. I'll send you the slides. Uh, one last, uh, Hosani, if you allow me, thank you so much. We have these opportunities uh, to, to, uh, to spread the news. So I invite you to, to join me in this Segundo Ciclo de Palestras of my study group. So we have uh, a lot of, uh, for example, Monica Marink and Roshani Rojo also talking about technologies, etc. I'll send you the, the news about this and the folders, the digital folders. And now I said thank you many times. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Daniel and Ronaldo, for the great talk. There are lots and lots of comments on uh, YouTube and here on Zoom, too. And there are six questions. It's the first time that we're going to use this resource, so let's see if it works. There is a person that raised her hand. It's Maurilia Macedo de Souza. So I thought we could start with her question. And then we can move on to the questions that are open here. And then there are some questions that were sent through, um, through YouTube, okay? I'll try okay. not to, to miss anybody, but if we are, I don't know, if we are short of time, we'll stop. I'll see if I can, uh, Maurilia, would you like to talk? I open the microphone, I think. But your microphone, you need to open it it's, um, if you want to ask the question. Okay. While we wait for Maurita, maybe she'll... She said she doesn't want. She doesn't want to. Okay. So I'll unmute. So, can, uh, so I'm going to go and see the questions here from the question and answer. Um, 
I think you two can also see the questions. I don't know if they appear to you. Can you? Yes, yes, I yeah? can. So the first one is addressed to Professor Ronaldo by Marília Torres, but she actually uh, sent me a, a second version of the question later on, so I'll skip it, okay? Because she elaborated a little bit more on that question. So I'll go to Fernanda da Costa Alves. She asks, Professor Daniel, do you think that there are disadvantages of using technology in classrooms? Great. Who was the question from again? I'm so from, sorry. From Fernanda. 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 Fernanda, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm really worried about this idea of, uh, I'm inventing an, an English word now, godify, you know, turning uh, technology into the savior, especially now in the pandemic crisis within isolation. And Fernanda, I can share with you a very negative side of technology, which is the exclusion. Um, uh, as I told you, my sociolinguistics uh, classes, groups, I was really, really, Fernanda, I, I, I was really uh, uh, frustrated because I was thinking about get, taking my car, going to USP, print the text and take the text to my students uh, in order to try to accommodate everybody. Because it's very easy for students who were included and they could follow my classes, but what about the ones who were living at Cruspi, the, the residence, the residential place for students? Believe it or not, at USP, students don't have Wi-Fi for all of those blocks, or at least they didn't, you know, within the pandemic time. So uh, technology can bring very dark signs. For example, exclusion. I don't know if I have answered you. Um, also, when we think about, like Ronaldo mentioned, when you think about implementing, I think it's very dangerous to consider technology as tools. Because as Ronaldo explained, and I agree with him, and I tried to show this through another perspective, it's first of all uh, an, an, an knowledgeable and epistemological discussion before it is a tools implementation discussion. So um, I gave you two examples of, uh, so things can go very bad <laughs> um, with uh, implementing uh, new technologies. And here I'm, I'm just considering the digital, the digitality and the internet, because we have lots of other possibilities like the body technology or other forms of technology. Uh, let me just, can I, can I, can I comment also? Uh, I also agree with uh, Danielle, and I also think that when implementing, sometimes we have some disadvantages. I remember uh, one episode, for example, that I was working with memes, and I mean, teenagers, sometimes they are kind of cruel, and uh, we need to be very careful when, uh, creating the learning experience and trying to uh, uh, think about the, the constraints uh, also of the activity and informing students that they should use the technology ethically. Uh, so, because I mean, the, when we use the technology, the digital technology, it empowers our voice. So uh, when thinking about these activities uh, 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 using digital technologies, we should also think about the rules and um, yes, that's it. Okay. The next question is also by Fernanda, it's a follow up. I think both of you can, can answer is, do you think that teachers are being prepared in the undergraduate programs to use technology in the classroom? Do you want to start, Daniel? No, you can start, Ronaldo, please. Yeah. Well, um, I can see a lot of change um, from when I was uh, studying, for example, and now I can see a, a, a lot of improvement. Um, at UFMG, for example, we have uh, classes in undergrad, <clears throat> sorry, undergraduation classes. I teach one of them. Uh, which is called uh, Recursos Tecnológicos Aplicados ao Ensino, in which we uh, 
explore uh, possibilities with the students and help them creating uh, uh, learning experiences with the students and not focusing so much on the tool. But I mean, it is a process and I believe, I, I didn't say this before, but, and I believe that this, uh, not the secret and not the solution, but teacher education is very important. We need more programs and we need more investment in teacher education, initial education and continuing uh, education. And I mean, we are being prepared. Teachers are being prepared, but uh, we need a lot more. Um, yeah, I'll be very brief, uh, Fernanda. I, I, I think that after 2015 with this, the reform of the licenciaturas, things have gotten better. I want to believe in that. And I can give you the example of Projeto Nacional in which we see, we have this discussion of technology uh, being put on the table, you know, so the, within the reform of at least 30 public universities, federal universities in Brazil, this is being considered, discussed and uh, debated. Okay, this is the, the impression that I have from all the, the conferences. Uh, so this is something very important for us not to just keep the failure. Oh, no, 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 it has been very bad forever. There, are, there, there, there have been attempts, but I agree with Ronaldo, it's, not, it, it's very difficult to, to generalize. Okay, uh, so after 2015, I see a lot of change. I have seen this, um, and I can give you two examples. UFMG, yeah, with the, the brilliant work of Vera Menezes, Andrea Matos, all of them bringing their own perspectives to technology, bringing online classes, online graduate classes, entire online graduate classes for more than a decade now, for, for, for a lot of time. And also Kiria Finaji, who's here with us uh, at UFIS. And at Federal Spirit Santo, the whole curriculum was revised and re, uh, renewed, thinking about every discipline, how should technology be uh, part of it. So I see a lot of changes. I feel I see a lot of positive changes, okay, in teacher education. Of course, I'm not being romantic, etc. Okay, I we know we have a lot to to. We have a lot to, to do. We have a lot of work to do. And now it's very difficult because we're, we're, we're being cut. We're being eliminated, exterminated from, from the agenda. So we need, when we talk about that, we need to form this net, this national net to fight this back. Um, yeah, there are questions in many places here. I'll try to <laughs> summarize some of them. Sometimes your answers already covered some of these questions, okay? Um, one of the questions sent on um, type on YouTube was by Natalia de Souza. And she asks, what are some tips you would give to public school teachers? And I'll, I'll join, I'll add another question here on the chat that says, do you think that um, Disciplines of technology and education can also add topics of emergency teaching. Um, so I'll start talking about public school. Uh, um, I mean, I was a public school teacher uh, not long ago. And um, I think we should use, as I said before, we should use the technologies students have access to. Uh, and not all the work should be done, uh, can be, uh, should be done inside the classroom. We can expand our classrooms and maybe ask the students to do their work outside the, the, the classroom. Uh, and I mean, Brazilians, we are very creative. Uh, there is a, uh, Rodrigo Aragão from uh, Universidade Estadual, uh, Estadual de Santa Cruz in Ilhéus. Uh, he, he has a project there of, I mean, teacher education project, and he was following a, a, a school in which uh, they, did, they had those computers. I mean, that project, um computador por aluno, it's an old project, uh, but the class, the school didn't have, uh, I mean, 
plugs for, so the students could not charge the computers. So they created uh, uh, other uh, uh, alternatives, what Rodrigo called, uh, uh, um, what, what's the word? Uh, when we don't have, when we don't know how to do something and then we do something uh, different. We have, we have to improvise. Uh, I forgot the word now, but I mean, uh, talking about public schools, we need to use the technologies students have in their uh, hands. So, and I believe it's, it's uh, we can, uh, for example, work uh, on a topic for example, work about writing emails. We don't we don't need to uh, practice that using computers or cell phones. We can practice that in a meta linguistic uh, way. So there are always ways, and of course, infrastructure is important. Uh, but and I mean, we should uh, take advantages of the technologies we have and students have. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I, I follow in the same the same direction. I think the uh, the, the first education and emergency definitely uh, we can do a lot of things with technology because uh, uh, considering them as um, for example, if you consider them not only as a tool but as a possibility of discussion, so you can do a lot of things. You know. Uh, we have the world to explore, but the tips that Natalia asked for. Uh, I tried to bring some tips in my in my presentation, thinking about the very practical domain, thinking about the very practical dimension. But my my main tips, my main tip, let's say, would be two keywords: discussion and negotiation. So it's always sometimes we forget that we have students in the classroom, and sometimes we forget that our morning students are different, very, very, quite different, opposite to our evening night students. They're different. They come with different energies. Their bodies are differently tired, etc. So I think, and it, you don't have to apply the same, the same technological activity or pedagogical practice in the morning at night. You, you see what I mean? You can do it in the morning or not at night, at night. So, but negotiating with the students, um, the possibility of using, guys, let do, let's do this. Would you agree? Do you think it would be nice if we have this, this activity in the lab now? Do you think it will be profitable, enriching? Negotiate with the students instead of, okay, stand up, go to the lab, okay? And then, so negotiation is important and, number in, and discussion. I think we can, um, we can discuss about technology, uh, not having technology. We can do things as replacement without having the technology. So uh, my, the, the, the issue for me, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been researching visual literacy and, and, and digital literacies for 20 years now. And uh, people always ask me, but what about the structure, the internet fails? They, of course, they're important questions. If you have structure from this, move on. From this starting point, move on. But if you don't, it cannot, this, this will not prevent you from discussing technology, social media, et cetera, et cetera, with the students with a printed text like, uh, Ronaldo just mentioned, you can bring a printed text to discuss. So discussing is as important as practicing because it is with the discussion that you can bring all of these interpretations, uh, critical thinking, uh, possibilities of thinking about life, the world, education. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, there is a question um, sent by Marilia here on the Q&A function. And it's, uh, how do you see the transformation from face-to-face -face classes or talks to online ones? And then she added some more details to the question. She wants to, she wants you to address the issues of uh, meaning making, ways of doing, identity and power relations.
Do you want me to start, Ronald? Ronald? You can, you can start. Yeah, yeah. Wow, this is a question. <laughs> yeah, it's this longer is... than that. I just yeah. made it shorter. <laughs> it's it's a, like a PhD four-year question. Thank you, Marilia. Uh, I can talk about my own experience. Very hard. Uh, I, I, I already, when I was a professor at Universidade Paulista, I was one of the prof English professors who was responsible for the virtual classes. And here I'm talking about 10 years ago, but even so, uh, the, 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 the negotiation with students, this pressure in order to become technological, digital teachers, and also the, uh, the, the exclusion, which is something that a name is in the spotlight now. Uh, these are some, these, these were very, very hard things for me, very difficult choices. I, I felt really bad for the students who sent me emails. And uh, so this is the background talk. Now, uh, I'm really proud to say that this, this semester I taught five disciplines. <laughs> it was a crazy semester plus graduate, plus post-graduation. And the feedback that I had was really, really, really interesting. I see some of my students are here and Asada is here, some of them. And uh, I, I had a really positive aspect, because, uh, feedback, because what I, what I tried to do is, I, I didn't try to, to simulate face-to-face -face classes, but I tried to do a lot of interaction. I left them time to interact even though I am not happy, I'm at, at this point, I, I think I'm sure I can get better. Uh, this is why we need the net. This is why we need to be dialogue, dialoguing amongst ourselves. But I, it is a big challenge. Um, uh, and it involves a lot of preparation. More preparation, I think, than face-to-face -face classes because interaction, I mean face-to-face -face interaction, was taken away from us. And uh, how do you work with mini-making identities and power? Power relations, really hard, because the teacher becomes the central, back again. Lots of teacher talk classes, unfortunately, even though I tried to avoid that, I gave them a lot of interactions. Sometimes I left the room and, and, and left them interacting, talking amongst themselves. Sometimes I asked them to go to other rooms, to other digital rooms, lots of image interpretation. I worked a lot with cinema, but even so, I, 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 a self-critique, a lot of centrality from me. The identities, uh, it's very, it's harder to, 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 to see the students because they switch off the camera and switch off the, the, the microphone. So it's a new way of cutting classes, cabular aulas. So students cut classes, they close and they don't know. Sometimes you ask students, hey, Pedro, uh, what do you think? And Pedro is never there. So, uh, so we have this and this has a lot to do with identities, right? So what, what is the identity the students want to show us uh, and show the group? And mini making, uh, I think it's it's a very interesting uh, uh, possibility because students are, are really, I think, uh, they are, if they are not the Pedros I mentioned, they are with you. They are really, really concentrated and producing mini all the time. So this was my experience this uh, this term that has just uh, ended. Okay, and thank you, Marilla, for the question. Very, very important dimensions. Um, I agree 100% with Danielle, and I think it's very important for us to distinguish here uh, distance education and remote teaching. Uh, what we're experiencing now is remote teaching. It's an emerg uh, I mean, it's an em emergency uh, regime. So uh, what I see is that people are... Uh, sometimes say, ah, we're doing distance education. No, uh, and a lot has to be uh, re, re uh, conceptualized about that, especially, as I said before, teenagers uh, and also us, we cannot concentrate uh, on the screen all day long. So uh, as Danielle said, we were uh, 
face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interaction was uh, eliminated from us. And, but we shouldn't uh, rep try to replicate the face-to-face -face interaction in the online environment. Uh, there is a lot of emphasis on the synchronous uh, interaction, but we have lots of asynchronous uh, interaction activities that are very uh, uh, good for uh, our uh, practice. So we don't need to do all uh, live. We can, we can uh, work asynchronously too. So I think we, we should think a lot about that and not try to replicate what we used to do in our classrooms in, now in this remote teaching uh, that will end someday soon, I hope. I hope. Okay, um, there are some questions about the learners, right? I'll try to mix up two questions here, Daniele Wiesentainers and Ana Paula Engelbert's question. They are both concerned with uh, how much advantage students are taking from these online classes because of the, they lack familiarity with this uh, type of class. And Ana Paula's question is more uh, about learners' autonomy and how much these online classes or how much technology would promote uh, learners' autonomy. Um, can I go first? Sure. Yes, yeah. Um, again, it's uh, I, I, again, I can just speak from my from my context and uh, some experiences that I've been um, sharing and, and being shared with some colleagues, because I think the impression I have the federal universities, they are starting now, many of them, for example, Espirito Santo, they are preparing themselves to so very differently from my context in which we're overnight do it, you know, as I said, not demanding, but between quotation marks, marks kind of demanding, but anyways, but um, I, I, I think uh, students' autonomy is really, really interesting. And uh, Ana Paula, this, I, I think this can be enhanced but again, depending on the context, depending on the teacher's preparation, depending on the depending on the teacher's view of technology, depending on the objective, the what, the hows, the whys, and the whens. So it depends a lot on this, at least to me. Uh, and I can give you Ana Paula and uh, Daniele one example of what students are taking. Let me try to be brief. Evaluation. Tough talk. Tough, tough talk. What I do, I ask, uh, usually face-to-face, -face, I ask for, um, let's say, continuous uh, evaluation, presence, reading, blah, 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 and response papers. They are subjective papers. They have to be really, really personal. They are not academic, let's say. They have to talk about themselves, like narratives. Um, so what I did, I said, I, I invited all my students, 130 students. I opened four, four or five Google Meets in different times of the day and the week. And then I asked them, what do you want? How do you want to be evaluated? Tell me, how would you like to be evaluated? Let's talk about this. And uh, so students started bringing their ideas and we ended up with five possibilities of evaluation assessment, papers, videos, students could record videos, uh, interviews with me, talk, self-evaluation talk with me on, on, on video, video talk. I can't remember the fifth one, but we, we decided together as a whole group on five kinds of evaluation. And now I have, each student have decided. So this is for me, students autonomy. They are telling me within the pandemic time, crisis, isolation, depression, anxiety, etc. how they want to be evaluated. More work for me, yes, but it's my job. It's my job to listen to them and to really accommodate their willingness to be evaluated. I'm so grateful I did this conversation with the students, again, negotiation, 
And they are very, very glad. They told me, Daniel, thank you so much for being so understanding, so comprehensive, so open for the different possibilities because I would not be able to write a paper. I, but I, I would, I, I'm able to record a video to talk to you in the video, with, uh, within, through the video. Uh, so this is what I did. And I think this, is, this enhanced a lot students' autonomy. And the students that finished the, the course, the, the, the disciplines, the courses, they, they, I have this impression they, they, they were dealing with this autonomy a lot. They had to organize them, themselves very differently. Um, and, um, and this is it. I have this example of the evaluation that was really, really successful. And I think when we return next year, uh, I will continue with this kind of work. I will talk to them face to face. How would you like to be evaluated? Uh, uh, you know. And just, just adding uh, something here, uh, it has to do, uh, in my opinion, with a new culture of teaching and learning. We are not uh, used to learning and teaching like that. And I see that in, in my classes at UFMG, for example, sometimes students uh, decide to take the class just because it's online, I mean, in the past, right? Just because it was online, because in their, in their point of view, the online class was easier because they, they couldn't, they shouldn't have to go to campus. And uh, what happened was that they failed the class because they didn't do the activities, because the notion of presence is different, is different in the online environment. In a face-to-face -face class, class, you just, if you are there, you are present. But in the online environment, presence is different. So there, there are lots of differences that we are not used to to and the students also so we have to uh, raise awareness on those of those differences with them i think it's the first step uh, to raise awareness of those differences of how it is how is how we learn in a digital environment in an online class because it's there are lots of differences and we should not uh, repeat uh, try to replicate what we do in a face-to-face -face class. So I, I'm really glad that you did that, Daniel. Talk to the students because it's really nice. Because when they when they are part of the process, the the, the notion of presence be, becomes so much uh, uh, present there in the so much visible, so so much more visible, right? So I I believe in this negotiation in, uh, as a way of constructing as a way of uh, uh, learning how to teach and learn in the online environment. Okay, there are four more questions. I don't know if you are still willing to go on and answer them or if you want okay. me to choose. <laughs> it's up to you. It's really, really up to you. I'm having fun. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask the question sent by Professor Clarissa Jordão, she, said, she asks, can all the recent emphasis on remote learning overload teachers, especially when they need to teach large classes? It's a very okay. short a answer. Big yes. yes, a big yes. <laughs> a big yes, Clarissa, big yes. unfortunately. Yeah, a big You're yes. Work a lot more. Mm -hmm. Okay. At UFMG, I, I'm kind of used because I was uh, selected at UFMG to teach only online classes. So I only teach online classes there at undergraduation and the graduate program. I always I only teach online. So my my friends, they, they sometimes say, oh, you're very lucky. You are, you only work online, but I work all day long. I will, I wake up and I have breakfast in my office and I start and I start working and I work 24/7. It, it at first it was a little bit difficult for me to shut I mean to sleep to go to, because it you just keep working. So it's uh, we get a lot 
as Clarissa said, we get overloaded with the amount of work and we should set boundaries because otherwise uh, we just work 24 seven. Definitely. For uh, just to complement what I did, like what I always do with on face-to-face -face classes, I ask students to do some very some interactions and write something. Write a paragraph. Uh, do work together. Uh, try to find something. So when they when we are together, they 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 give me this right away. So I have all of these materials to correct. Now online, I have 100 students, 130, 40 students <laughs> sending me. So each activity needs to be really, really well thought because if it's just uh, something, okay, write a paragraph about this video. I have 130 paragraphs on my email or on Moodle to check very differently from being with them. And you know, uh, you you evaluate everybody, exchange each one, you know, exchange things there. So really hard work, really hard work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and even a discussion, when you have a discussion in a face-to-face -face classroom, I mean, as Daniel said, one complements the other, but one, you, when you have a discussion in a forum, for example, the amount of posts I mean, they're huge because everybody needs to participate. So there's there are no overlaps uh, uh, between speakers. So, I mean, in this way, you need to read a lot more. So mm -hmm. the, the, we work a lot more. Okay, there is a related question here by Ana Laura Castro. How do you think that the academy is reaching teachers and helping them right now? I mean, teachers that are not embodied in the discussion. Hi, Ana Laura. Ana Laura is from uh, Espírito Santo. She was my student in the undergraduate, Letras Inglês, and she did a master's in technology. Very provocative, Ana Laura. Uh, I think we are trying to do our best. Uh, as I said, uh, we cannot save the world, but... Um, we, we, as, as you, I, again, very difficult to generalize, but I see this movement of sharing, uh, for example, Ana Laura, this wonderful event tonight, the wonderful discussion for almost 150 educators, teachers around Brazil. This is the job of the university for me. This is something we are here until no, until this time of there are some of us didn't even have dinner and we are here studying together, discussing together. So this is one of the, I think this is one of the, 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 the roles of education that uh, sometimes we do not consider, but being here together in this net is the university doing something and answering back everything that we've been suffering and all this, this fight. Of course, we, we should do more. Yes, but we are not heroes. We are not, we, as, as Ronaldo said, we work a lot, overload. We already have our undergraduate classes, a lot of things. So um, I think we're doing our, our, our jobs at a certain extent. I think universities could be doing more, especially with in-service or with continuous education, let's say, with teachers that are already there. Uh, but we've been doing a lot. We've been doing a lot. I think if we put together all of our works, myself, Rosani, Ronaldo, Alison, just the four of us right now, if we put this in, everything together, you will see a lot of things that we've been doing uh, uh, in relation to society. Okay? I yeah, think. and I believe it was a good thing that came out of this pandemic uh, was that now university is finally breaching society and accomplishing its extension mission. Uh, so I think it's one of the good things that uh, we, we can continue doing after uh, this pandemic is over, uh, being more present in the society using technology. Right, I think the last question then is a very long one, so I'll try to make it short. It was sent by Pierre Silva Machado. And he, I think it's a provocative question too. He says, isn't it dangerous to imply we have to use technologies in order to make students engage when education and learning 
have much more to do with access to scientific knowledge and critical thinking. I think if I understood his question, aren't we putting the focus on the wrong thing, like too much focus on technology instead of uh, the content that we should be working with? I agree with Pierre. We don't have to use technologies. Uh, we have to use, I mean, we have to use technologies because technologies uh, are things we use to accomplish things, but they don't need to be digital. Uh, so, I mean, we do, we use technologies all the time. Uh, for, uh, at, the, at first, a person asked me to develop a little bit more the notion of writing as a technology. Yes, writing is a technology. And uh, I mean, we can use that if we cannot use um, uh, digital. And it's not just using technology to engage students. As I said, we need to have uh, uh, our uh, pedagogical and linguistic objectives very well uh, thought before selecting the, the technology we're gonna use. So I, I, I agree with you, Pierre. We don't have to use technologies uh, to engage students. Yeah, I, I agree. You totally, I agree as well. It's, uh, it's, the, it's the big talk now, especially because of the pandemic. We are all, you know, beating heads. We are all, you know, confused. We are, we are also isolated, you know, Pierre. We are human beings, you know, we have our families, we have our, our challenges. So th this is all involved. So I, uh, technologies are, especially the digital ones, because of the pandemic now, they have been the focus. Before that, they were also the focus. But the problem is, for me, uh, how, how, you, how should you implement or the decision? How should you take the decision? Uh, very similar to what Ronaldo just said. Uh, I gave you the example of the bodies uh, of technology. When I do that activity with the human camera, I don't tell my students, look, we're going to discuss technology of the body, blah. No, let's do it and let's experience it in order to, to, to see what happens, this multimodality going on. But uh, I do agree with you, it can be a very dangerous path, uh, especially now that everybody is under pressure to turn everything into te technological. It should be discussed. Each context, each university, each educational program, teacher education program, each group, each classroom, each group should be, and we will see different decisions. Some groups will decide for live classes. Let's follow every week like morning students, but night students, not all of them, because they, they, they get home really, really tired and they decide to watch the classes later you record the classes and they watch it later during the week. Some students don't want to do the videos. They hate it to be sitting down for two hours and blah, blah, blah. so they prefer to read the texts and interact with the professor with the knowledge from the text. So you have a multiplicity of identities, talking about identities that should be negotiated. But I think the way this government is looking at technologies, you know, it's a very, very authoritarian way. Do it, uh, it doesn't matter if you are excluded, included, just do it, just do it. We are, you know, this idea of um, uh, this new liberal idea that uh, everybody can do it. And, uh, but it's not like that, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So uh, there was a last question by Professor Eduardo Figueiredo, who will be here with us for the next session. But I think you already addressed it. It was about examples of how technology is being used for language um, teaching, right? So I'll skip that one. There is a final question. It's just somebody, Bruna de Paula Silva, asking Professor Daniel to, to mention again the event that that you advertise. Uh, ah, okay. I, maybe I can send Rosani and Alison the. Mm -hmm. The, the info because um, mm -hmm. I'm about to, to close the, 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 I mean, the program. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you could kindly send Bruna or Bruna, send me an email. It's mm -hmm. danielle, F-E, 
at usp.br. It's going to be é, primeiro ciclo de, é, segundo ciclo de palestras, é, e a gente vai, é muito parecido com esse evento, a gente vai fazendo discussões transdisciplinares, é, e vai ter discussão sobre filosofia, tecnologia, é, a lot of discussions, I switched down to Portuguese, I don't know why, but because of the event, uh, but the event will be in English and in Portuguese, some, some, event, some of them in English, some of them in Portuguese, So uh, we, I would be really, really glad if we can keep on the, the, the conversation. It's, it will start in uh, August or September. Okay, Bruna, and I can send you all the, the information for sure. Yes, please send us too so we can advertise to our students, okay? So, Alison, do you want to say anything? Yes, I'd just like to thank both Daniel and Ronaldo I must say that it was a privilege to learn from both of you, from your talks, and also from the dear audience that we had tonight, that there were dear friends sending us questions and comments, affectionate questions. Um, Pastor Clarice, Eduardo, Ana Paula, Alessandra, uh, thank you very much for coming. They are my dear friends from the department, so it felt like family being here. And all the, the, uh, the anxiety that I felt in the beginning from setting up all the technology, uh, it wore off a little bit after I saw them here. So thank you very much, Daniel and Ronaldo. It was a privilege to, to be with you here. And also I'd like to thank the audience for their um, participation. Yeah, so just like Alison, um, I want to thank everybody, and especially Danielle and Ronaldo. And all the uh, the audience was all excited. There are lots and lots of comments on YouTube, so I was trying to follow them. There are some comments here on Zoom, but there are many comments on YouTube. I think they, they disappear, right, after our discussion. But it was um, a great a great start for us we are also learning how to do these online talks we <laughs> we had some problems with the link for youtube so i Alison immediately created a new one so you'll see that well everything is sorted out but i think that's how we we are learning how to do this right and we will know that technology is also so unpredictable <laughs> and um But I thank Alison for the assistance. I don't think I'm going to be that good at assisting him when it's his turn to be doing the, the mediation. <laughs> But I will try. And um, yeah, so thank you so much. And I hope to see you for uh, our second meeting is on uh, July the 30th. We'll be talking about English as a lingua franca. And we have uh, two guest speakers too. Professor Savio, who was also here, Domingo Savio, who was also here with us, and Eduardo Figueiredo. They were both here watching also, uh, and we'll meet again in two weeks then. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosani. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Bye. everybody. Thank you for being with us until now. Thank you. Rosani, do you want us to stay here a little bit while or we can we can leave? Can we can we leave? Yes? Yeah? Okay. Bye bye. Bye Ronaldo. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Rosani, can you stop the live stream? I cannot. <laughs>